by the Consumer Policy Committee of ISO in recognition of the point that Hunter brought up, the, 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 the trust issues that consumers had with respect to representations that were being made by uh, companies uh, about more than just whether or not this product, uh, this battery will last this long, but how was the battery made, where was the battery made, what sorts of environmental and social uh, impacts does this battery have, etc. Uh, and uh, what is the company doing with respect to its workers, with respect to the communities, etc. So that was really the start of the process. It started off uh, as a uh, ISO Capoco asking for a corporate social responsibility uh, standard, ISO standard. And the reason why it became a social responsibility standard was this recognition that ISO standards, as a general rule, apply to all types of organizations. They do not apply just to corporations. And so that's why the C was lost. It wasn't a uh, campaign by the uh, uh, powerful uh, industry organizations around the world and they were successful in you know, crushing the hapless consumer. No. Uh, ISO standards, for example, ISO 9001 quality management and ISO 14000, those are not corporate quality management standards and corporate uh, environmental management standards. They're just environmental management standards for all organizations or quality management standards for all organizations. So that's why the C was dropped. Uh, and I think it actually turned out to be a very interesting move because it is saying all types of organizations, whether you are a consumer organization or you are an NGO of any sort, uh, whether you are a labor organization, whether you are a parastatal uh, uh, organization, so for example, uh, Ontario Hydro in the day or what have you, uh, this applies to all types of organizations. So just that's a little background on that point. Now, David, were you not the consumer representative for Canada in that process? So I'm going to give you the final word if you want to just say a final point with respect to the consumer perspective um, on, on this, uh, given that that was the, 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 the perspective that you were representing at the uh, international table. You don't have to take that uh, opportunity. I'd like to open it up to, to comments as well. So uh, I leave this in your still in capable hands. Well, I guess just to say, you know, you're bringing it full circle and then going back to the consumers, which is also an area that was typically left out in a lot of social responsibility standards, where it's like, you know, activists or, you know, the, the, the chosen few. And, and, and uh, it's always a problem, and Howard, I'm sure you, you'll, you'll agree, whenever we talk about consumers, I mean, well, who is that? Um, when, when, you know, because it's not all of us. Um, I was... Um, I particularly chuffed to, to, to hear your report because we actually wrote that report for the CC, so I was happy to see that again. That's still being used, so that's good. So um, yeah, c coming back full, full circle, I think, is again coming back to this question that was raised earlier about um, you know credibility enhancing it, and I think that's still the area that we're on. Um, of the originally operationalizing the, the purpose, uh, we talked about the three Cs of, of convergence and uh, coherence and credibility. It's probably the last C that we're still, you know, uh, developing new tools on, and working also in that space um, to gain cross, uh, trust among, um, you know, different groups who want to see end of pipeline kind of results, to those who want to see you have the right policy and processes in place, because there's all sorts of different ways to to, to take that. Um, but hopefully, we see this as an emerging picture, and uh, that, um, and, and and the nice thing about a guidance standard also, to at least start, is that uh, you know it takes the approach as if. Um, you know, we're, we're all searching for the truth and none of us have the possession of it. And so it's a kind of, everyone can kind of pitch in at this point. And so there's still a lot of evolutionary elements, but I, which I think are quite exciting for, for all of us. There's a very trite uh, expression which I'm going to trot out now, because uh, uh, as, as with a lot of trite expressions, it has uh, some truth to it. And that is that social responsibility is a journey, not a destination. <laughs> <laughs> I know, kind of. But, uh, uh, and, and I'm not a consultant either, so that's remarkable that I would uh, throw that out, because that just means, therefore, as a consultant, you need to pay for me for many years to come. But, uh, as I said, I'm not a professor. Uh, however, it does raise a very important point. This is version 1.0 of ISO with respect to the social responsibility standard. As I said, we're seeing the space being occupied by increasing numbers of other standards, ISO standards and otherwise, and we're seeing evolution in terms of what governments are doing in this space, what businesses are doing in this space, um, and, and so very much this is a, uh, a story that we um, arguably are in a position to participate in the next stages, uh, and that is with respect to what we do now 
with respect to the ISO 26000 standard as a national standard here in Canada. So uh, let me just say that, that um, Anne Maria at the CSA, uh, David Simpson as chair of the committee, myself as a member of that committee, uh, Ozzy as a, uh, as a member of that committee, and so on, uh, we're very interested to hear your thoughts as to how we can best uh, operationalize it or diffuse it uh, within Canada for Canadian organizations to use with their operations in Canada and around the world. And so now, I would like to pass uh, uh, the baton, or the feather, as it might be, over to you. Are there any particular comments or questions? If you could identify your, your name first before you speak, and we will just, I see three or four hands strengthening up here, so we will go kind of uh, my right to left. Please. I'm Jane Garrison, and I think around a lot of social innovation spaces, like Marks and Rothman and uh, Center for Social Innovation, no one ever, ever, ever has mentioned 26,000 in right. those contexts. All of them are talking about whether they are proving that they're a good organization by becoming a B Corp, right. or whether they should become a B Corp, and I didn't notice that on the linkage. Right. Can, I don't, can somebody speak to the B Corp issue? Well, B, seems to be getting more leverage. B Corp, uh, B stands for Benefit, uh, Benefit Corporation. And Benefit Corporation is another example of a certification standard. So it's a voluntary standard. But actually, um, the governments in Canada and the United States are also developing uh, legislation around Benefit Corporations. Essentially, it's, it's uh, for those corporations who want to lead with um, a social responsibility um, goal as the kind of the lead goal of the organization. So not necessarily for profit, not necessarily philanthropic, but the, the, the number one thing is they want to, for example, address poverty, or they want to address literacy, or they want to address, you know, a, a, an issue like that. Um, they may want to make money, but that's not their, their, their primary motivation. So uh, that's what benefit corporations are. Uh, and so this, this space of the social entrepreneur uh, organization represents organizations that want to be known primarily by their uh, social slash environmental characteristic, as opposed to the vast majority of for-profit corporations that want to be known for putting out a product or a service of one sort or another. But what they also want to know increasingly is, how can I do that? How can I make a good profit and also uh, adhere to social and environmental standards? So I think that's why perhaps you haven't heard of it, is because the benefit corporation represents a very converted group of people. Those people who want to lead with, of all things that they do in a corporate structure, they want to lead with improving the environment or improving a particular social issue. Whereas the vast majority of companies are companies that want to lead with, you know, making money by selling you this thing or that thing. And and by the way, is there a way that we can also address our environmental or social responsibility? What I was asking is whether a linkage document would be helpful. That's a good idea. I think there there easily could be. Uh, moving on. And again, you've got to identify yourself. I'm uh, yeah, Dennis Jones. I'm uh, uh, the chair of the Corporate Social Responsibility Committee of the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada. Uh, my background is in mining. And uh, I've noticed that uh, although the mining industry is heavily regulated, much of it is mandatory, uh, when it comes to taking on voluntary standards, there's always been a pushback by uh, groups like NGOs, for example, who are critical of the mining industry. I'm just wondering, have you seen that sort of pushback on ISO 26000? And if so, how are you dealing with that? And how might that affect future versions of 26000? ISO 26000 is a um, um, one standard among many that are out there. But it's the only one which has that kind of advantage of being comprehensive and one which went to a great deal of trouble to uh, reference and consider the perspective of other entities that are already out in this space. Uh, as Jonathan uh, mentioned, Jonathan Fowler mentioned uh, from my perspective, the reason why he found so viable in his work with De Beers was exactly that. It brought things all together. Um, NGOs, non government organizations, many of them, not all of them, Many of them start from the proposition that government is the answer to whatever is your question. 
right? And so um, they're always advocating for another law um, and for more regulation. And, um, and that's a very understandable position. So a lot of uh, NGOs in the, in the mining space are advocating for exactly that. So they want more laws, they want more enforcement, and I don't disagree with them that, that there's, there's space for that. So generally speaking, you do not see, in the mining area, you do not see a lot of NGOs advocating for anything other than law, and more law, and more regulation, etc. Um, what's interesting though, is that where we see the most exciting development on the mining area is with respect to things that are not in law right now. For example, free prior and informed consent is a concept that, as of yet, right now, is not in law. But we're finding increasing numbers of mining companies saying, we need to go that way anyway. Uh, and so that's a good example of, of uh, what ISO standards are typically doing. They're typically kind of ahead of where law is, but they can model or be a precursor for that. Uh, and organizations that want to show that they are ahead tend to use them. So that's a, a, a good answer. A um, couple of hands here, and we're heading over to the left. Again, if you're going to have yourself, there's two in a row. Um, first, uh, I, yeah, thank you, Kenahan. Andres Recalde, uh, consultant in, for the mining sector, um, I mean, from Latin America. I have been following the D6000 since the beginning as well, but from a different perspective, looking always at the stakeholders in Latin America. Right. But I have been a witness of coming to companies. Latin America here and um, asking the same question, maybe the same happened today or tomorrow. What is the value? Of, what is the business case for doing this investment? Tell me, what, 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 what is my share in the stock exchange going to be late because I invest right. 100000 dollars in CSR? Right. Right. Again, this is something very critical, no? The reality of emerging markets yes. and the behavior of corporations deciding how to take budgets right. into the initiative? Great question. The, the quick answer on that is that there's been an excellent study, I think it was put out by Queensland University in Australia, and I think it was Harvard in the United States, called the Cost of Conflict. And it's basically looking at how increasingly, in Latin American contexts uh, especially, but also in, uh, in other uh, regions around the world, mining companies are finding themselves bogged down <coughs> Uh, due to a great deal of resistance from communities and NGOs with respect to their projects. And arguably, ISO 26000, along with many other things, <coughs> represents an investment that uh, mining companies are taking on to decrease the likelihood of conflict down the line. Uh, you mentioned the point of stakeholders, and um, ISO 26000 emphasizes the need to engage with stakeholders from the outset and throughout, and meaningful engagement, not uh, one way download of uh, this is how great we are, but rather, you know, is there a way we can work this out? Which has led to a, a very Canadian uh, innovation, something called the Impact Benefit Agreements, which also now are in place in other parts of the world. But this is an agreement directly between mining companies and communities. Again, not the solution, but it's an example of a way in which mining companies are looking at exploring to how it is they can address these issues. That's a, that's a short answer. Mauricio, and then we'll carry on to the left here. Short, please. The importance of the ISO 26000 in Latin America, especially for Canadian mining companies that are doing exploration, is that uh, the national standards are quite lax and lacking. By adhering to a more uh, tough international standard, you really are avoiding, toward the future, conflicts that are extremely, extremely costly. Investing in 26,000 is saving for mining companies. I should actually not bother responding uh, to Andre because Mauricio, you uh, have the response. Thank you very much. So we're moving to the left now. See your hand, sir. I'm Turpin from the University of Toronto, okay. also uh, from Latin America. Um, there's a there's a famous case uh, that passed before the Supreme Court of Canada, where a group of people in Ecuador 
uh, could uh, Chevron yeah. won the right to sue uh, Chevron. Yeah. I was wondering if uh, I, ISO 26000 plays any role in, in sort of guiding the process, um, the basis on which that group can sue Chevron, or if not, if the government <laughs> sort of adopts some of those norms into their decision. It doesn't have anything particularly to do with the Chevron. Of um, what is the correct venue for Ecuadorians to bring a lawsuit concerning a corporation that did harm in another jurisdiction, etc. Et so it gets down a very complicated legal rabbit hole. We, we don't need to go down. But what I can tell you is that um, Canadian courts have referred to ISO 26000 um, in preliminary uh, deliberations that they've had concerning litigation uh, with respect to a Canadian mining company in Latin America, where a lawsuit has been brought by um, villagers, uh, community representatives from Latin America, and that uh, um, lawsuit is winding its way through the Canadian court system as we speak. And in the early judgments with respect to that particular lawsuit, uh, the Judge Brown, Justice Brown in Ontario, referred to the ISO social responsibility standard and a number of others as potentially representing the standard of care by which uh, this mining company should be evaluated against. They didn't make a definitive determination on that, but um, uh, they did this as a result of Amnesty International uh, Canada uh, that, that made representation to the court, and so they acknowledged that contribution from Amnesty International. So that's, that's as far as I can take that one today. Uh, there's a whole course I teach on CSR and the law. Uh, welcome to join that uh, in, in due course. Um, my name is Adam McNary. I'm a corporate responsibility consultant and recently completed a tour of duty as CSR director for Grand Tierra Energy. Uh, my question to any of our speakers and perhaps those with extractive sector experience uh, are better positioned to answer, but I'm wondering how does ISO 26000 relate to um, or interplay with the IFC performance standards, which are the de facto standard in, for these industries and, and others. Okay. Anyone has a comment on that? Just before I pass it on to, to uh, say, Jonathan, who is like the director of experience in this area, yeah. the IFC performance standards, for those of you in the room who are not familiar, IFC, International Finance Corporation, which is uh, the kind of the, the lending side of the World Bank, World Bank being part of the broader UN uh, set of uh, institutions. and. Um, IFC lends money to big projects, infrastructure projects for developing countries uh, with the best of intentions. Um, uh, and uh, they insist that the recipients of those uh, uh, loans uh, meet certain requirements. And those are the things called IFC performance standards. So those are contract, uh, contractual uh, terms. If you're not a mining company that's getting a loan from the IFC, then you are not required to meet IFC standards by law. But you're right that it's kind of emerging as a, a, a critical standard to look at. And the equator principles, which is a set of uh, similar standards produced by the banks, is based on the IFC performance standards. And most of the key banks around the world have signed on to the equator principles. And like I say, they represent a kind of a distilled version of the IFC performance standards. How do they relate? Um, there's, there's total overlap. There's total overlap. They, they align extremely well. And in fact, the IFC performance standards talks about the need for management system standards, et cetera. So there's, there's good alignment. But I'm going to pass these over to Jonathan. Where are you? Where are you? Oh, there you are. Do you, you want to just add in something? Like that? My image of deception is right the IFC performance standards, you know, the guidance list. They fit very nicely within the envelope. <coughs> of the ISA 26000 framework, depending which performance standard you're dealing with, whether it's dealing with the environment, with indigenous people, et cetera, et cetera, you're fitting into different components of the standard. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that there's a good alignment, there's a good overlap. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. The bulges are. Are familiar with ISA 26000 in terms of this detailed questionnaire? I might have skimmed through it, but. It just seems that um, yeah, IFC covers most of the same areas, environmental health and safety, stakeholder engagement, some governments, I mean, it, it doesn't look at 
consumer product <coughs> issues too much, but otherwise, just in its application, it's maybe completely overlap, or I mean, I'm wondering if a company's going to be expected to, to do both or fill the gaps in with ISO 26000, or, you know, I guess we don't know yet because it's still an evolving standard and it's not been, you know, forcefully adopted by. I respect you. I actually follow that of what my colleagues comments on that. There will be a level of detail within the individual buckets within. The so. uh, I would say that's true. One of the most significant things about um, uh, where I started was this idea of they were not trying to um, compete with existing banks, but rather to complement them and to align with them. Because that was the thing that was missing. It's just this double <coughs> standards out there. So um, what Jonathan is saying is entirely in keeping with that. that they represent a distillation of uh, a extremely broad uh, cross-section of uh, developed and developing country organizations um, in terms of what uh, social responsibility is and how to deliver it. So I have to more detailed on how to certain specific areas. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, yes. I'm a stakeholder. Um, I'm a stakeholder research associate, and I just want a couple of clarifications. Dave, I think you mentioned 16,000 um, purchases have been made. Of the, is that correct? Standards? That's a correct from what I know from the, the, the secretariat. So okay. it's not and a, that's international? Yeah, but the, the problem is, is that they, there is no real... It's a pretty loose statistic right. at this point, but it's... So we don't know how many of those are companies or corporations? Or oh, systems. no, no, no. And e even the number itself is a... a there, there is different jurisdictions, for example, in you know, some areas of uh, Latin America, Chile, for example, the government has actually made them available for free. Um, and uh, you can even download it if you're, you know, if you're... If you're I mean, it's... You, you can get the standard with it in terms of the internet that's out there. Uh, that's all I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> a copy of the ISO 26000 standard now exists, please uh, get back to me after this is over and I will uh, send you to the, uh, the relevant uh, party who can, who can set that up. But that is, as I say, that's essentially for uh, developing country uh, people who otherwise could not afford it and students who are essentially in a similar condition in that respect. <laughs> only, in that, only in that respect, uh, gratefully. Um, yes, uh, was that hand or yes, yeah. So just to say is the NGOs are about the NGO pushback. There are other NGOs in the room. But yes, you want to identify which NGO you're uh, well the engineers love borders. Okay. Um, I think one one thing with ISO twenty six thousand the IFC performance standards they're they're more systematic and I think there's a line between the, the spectrum between hard law, soft law and greenwashing. I think if you want to move ISO twenty six thousand, you've got to make sure that you you're clear that you're not in that greenwashing category, and I might want to sort of condemn it because I think the NGOs have had enough of sort of, well, we, we didn't do anything about rights abuses, we're a member of the UN Global Compact. I mean, that's what we need. I think that there's, that, that, that's where the love, I think that gets lumped together. And I think that's always, it's always going to be for any voluntary standards so long as you have certain companies basically standing behind these standards right. in, a, in a ridiculous time. You're, you're absolutely right. That's one of the biggest mischiefs that's out there. Use a legal term is is the uh, abuse of, of uh, yeah. a standard of voluntary standards to, to to greenwash or redwash as we're talking uh, the social side rather than the environmental side um, um, activities that are really not all that good. Um, so uh, point point well taken. 
that there's also a, just to sure, add on to that point a, a level of expectations that different groups will have towards different standards or towards different behavior really, um, and that's what we're talking about even when we get into the area of certification. Um, what does that mean to people when you're talking about social responsibility? And what this is saying that in terms of uh, that the organization operationalizes, that they might have a, a policy, they have procedures, they're going out to talk to stakeholders, but that there's a, you know, Bob talked about a, you know, an arsenic spill. It's going to happen, right? But then you, you have that next to the thing that, oh, well, this is a socially responsible organization. What, you know, for, for end of pipe organizations saying, we were interested in the exact impact that's coming out of the end, that's not good enough. Right? And that's that's fine. I think that that's good. Others might say, like investors, uh, for example, or someone with a CA kind of background, are looking at suitable criteria. We want to know that the risks are taken in place, so that they're not just like rolling the dice, going, "Geez, I hope that no arsenic spills." But there's there's real processes and procedures uh, during that. Uh, and 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 both are, are are fine. But I think it's a level of expectations that are part part of all those standards as well. I, I would say we should be viewing ISO twenty six thousand as a kind of a a linkage document that fits with other standards that are out there. In the mining area, for example, an issue that has arisen is, is tailings uh, spills, horrific tailings spills, including in Canada. I can see there being developed a certified tailings management standard. It's not a replacement for law, on top of law, like there is now a cyanide certification standard. But What's nice is that ISO 26000 represents a kind of an uber view for which these other standards represent particular uh, subset slices for where a shoe is particularly pinched. So they're not in competition, rather um, they're operating in, a, in my opinion, an increasingly cohesive uh, international architecture linked one to the other. That's, that's where I see the movement as opposed to just chaos, which is uh, where, we, where we've come from. Long way to go, but that's where I'm. And you, sir, are going to get the final uh, comment on the okay. Thank you. My name is Tom Anamanakis. My business is called Ethos Assets. I'm a for-profit organization with a social purpose. I want to be certified as an ISO 26000 organization based on the standards we're in place right now. Now, I want to legally purchase it. Where do I go? <laughs> 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 um, here's, here's an interesting thing. There's, a, there's an entity called IQNet. And IQNet is a grouping of um, respectable uh, uh, standards related bodies uh, that have come together and they've taken ISO 26000 and they've made it into a certification standard, an international certification standard. Um, so that's an example of uh, now that ISO 26000 is there. These sorts of permutations and combinations are possible, and that's one of them. That's called IQ Net. Um, so, I'm going to stop it there. Um, I, in the room, I, I see a, an incredible amount of uh, expertise and uh, capability in all different varieties government, uh, and, and private sector, uh, NGO, uh, academic, and uh, so. Uh, let the conversation continue uh, after we formally end now. And just to alert you, there's a very interesting talk coming up on June 28th with respect to the whole issue of social license from the very individual who coined, uh, just the word coined, who first used the expression social license in a mining context, and from then on, it's gone on to its now highly contested uh, wide, wide use in many different uh, contexts. So stay tuned for that one on June 28th. This particular talk was supposed to be live streamed. Uh, that didn't happen due to some technical issues, uh, but it has been recorded. I will put the recording up, and I will send a note out to everybody who's on the e-list that it has, has been posted. And I will also put up the PowerPoints that everyone has, has been using. So I want to thank uh, the co-sponsors and the speakers for a fantastic job covering off an incredibly complex topic. I want to thank you for all your excellent comments. Have a good rest of June, and I'll see you on June 28th. Thank you very much.